Few people have pushed the envelope as much as Kalpana Morparia. For someone who was never really career minded as she will tell you, Kalpana's journey to the top has been spectacular. She started out with a law degree and a job at a traditional institutional investor ICICI. But as ICICI grew, so did she, playing a critical role in the transformation of it into a universal bank. However, what added a new dimension to Kalpana's journey was not just what she did here, but also what she decided to do once she retired, taking on another challenging job as head of JP Morgan in India. So when I met her, I began by asking her, did she ever think she would reach this far? Not one bit. As I've said in several of my interviews, all that I thought I wanted to do was get high school education, get married and have lots of children. The irony is I do not have any children, but have a career that is very fulfilling. So what changed? I mean, what do you think were the turning points that actually made this happen? So one is my mother, because my mother's no more now, but she had a single-minded focus. Uh, she was widowed very early in life, and she had a single-minded focus that you must achieve economic independence before you embark on anything else. So she was always very keen that her daughters get the best education and really equip themselves, as I told you, as in economic independence. So that was a great. Post my marriage, had a very facilitative uh, family. My husband was encouraging of me finishing my studies and going and working. And then the thing that really changed Mini for me was ICICI. I remember from my first day in ICICI, which was way back in 1975, so close to four decades now, I never looked back. And the ICICI story is so interwoven with the story of India's economic development and the development of India's financial uh, sector that it just gave us fantastic opportunities. Let me step back. So a lot of your peers who are now heading other banks were actually, they came up through the finance route of it. You know, they were core bankers yeah. as such. You were a lawyer. And within ICICI and then ICICI Bank, you got an opportunity to do be part of very important, pivotal points for the bank. But uh, when you started out, the legal department wasn't core to banking. So, I mean, in, in a sense, how was your early growth? So, you know, there are both good and bad in being a lawyer. So the good part was being a lawyer, you got involved in everything. Whether it was negotiating a canteen contract or whether it was helping in financing one of the largest projects in India or whether it was introducing a new financial product in the economy. And so as a lawyer, you had exposure to a whole lot, although one might argue that it was only from a legal viewpoint. But ICICI never viewed lawyers that way. Mm. They viewed lawyers as people who would facilitate business and therefore it was a great learning experience. The negative side of it is, so I never had any academic background in management or finance. My base graduation was in science. I did chemistry and microbiology which has zero relevance <laughs> in my work. Law had a fair amount of relevance in my work but I did miss out on some of the academic grooming that my colleagues had. You know, the other thing which is fascinating about you is that yours could be the story of any woman who ventured into a career not knowing what she was doing and, uh, you know, suddenly something clicked. So I'm going to ask you, you know, I've, I've heard it be said that ICICI was a great launch pad, a great place to grow for a lot of women. What were the two, three things that allowed you to A, get interested and passionate about what you do? Because I think that's the beginning of a, of a wholesome journey. So I think it also had to do with the uniqueness of ICICI's position in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. Because we were a developmental financial institution, so development was in our DNA, but we were in the private sector. So all your governance, your freedom, your entrepreneurship, your ability to innovate was th that of the private sector. And yet your mandate was to fulfill the development of India. You know, we were really there to finance the industrialization of India. So it put the institute in a very unique position. And we were very fortunate to have a set of leaders who used this position very, very effectively empowered their people to think innovatively and really do their best in terms of growing India's financial sector and financing India's industrial sector. I think that had a large, large part to it. 
it was also co coincidence that a number of women joined up ICIC at that time and women traditionally don't jump ship as <laughs> often just for a few thousand rupees more being offered by someone else. So we stayed the course in our careers in ICICI and the organization more than helped us through it. You know, every woman goes through a patch when their questions asked. Is it worth you know, the push? Should you not take it uh, forward? Should you take this risk? Did you go through those? Not once. Not once. Not once. Mm. Because for me, my work in some ways it was my life. Mm. And I never ever felt that by doing what I was doing and there were times when I was working 18 hour days as well, that I felt I was giving up on something else because I was so involved in my work. That's why people, you know, are very skeptical when I tell them that I actually felt like an entrepreneur in I say say. Because I felt it was mine, I had to make it happen. And the organization was supporting in making it happen. But were there pressures on you uh, to balance, you know, every woman also has a pressure, set of pressure at home to have kids, to have, uh, you know, a, a more balanced life. Were those pressures there for you as well or, or it was something that you actually no, I think worked I was around. very sorted that I was driven by what I was doing what the company was doing I was driven really by uh, that and therefore if there was a trade-off that I had to make I always made it in favor of my work not because I thought oh my god this what a huge sacrifice I'm making I just thought that was the right thing to do and no regrets and no regrets Yes, probably the only regret, I must be completely uh, honest on this, is the fact that I don't have children. And, you know, everyone asks me what is the one big regret. I have actually two regrets that I never was serious enough to pursue a management uh, degree. I just did law and took the first job Not that, that came my one. way. <laughs> Given what you've done. And the fact that I don't have children. Banking is dominated by women, but Kalpana Morparya is not a traditional banker. A lawyer by profession, she says she had to teach herself banking and management as she worked her way up the ranks in ICICI. But how tough was the next assignment she took after retiring from ICICI Bank? And what did the cultural shift at JP Morgan entail for her? The cultural shift in some ways was huge. I'll tell you what was similar and what was so different. So the similarity was dealing with professional people. In ICICI, we dealt with some of the smartest professionals, whether they were accountants, lawyers, or MBAs from some of the best schools in India. And I see a similar class of professional expertise here in JP Morgan. But the similarity kind of almost ended there because ours is a large MNC. We operate in 60 countries across the globe, 14 countries in the region, and work under a matrix structure. Hmm. So it was very different in terms of, you know, the command and control style that we had in ICICI. But the fact that I had a global platform to service our clients here in India, and as I tell Jamie Diamond, my boss, that I represent India and Indians. So everyone who wants to do business in India is something that we own. And every Indian, whether who does business in India, when I say every Indian, I mean the corporations and the financial institutions we cover, whether they do business in India or do go global, you know, we'd like to position ourselves as a banker of choice. Mm -hmm. So getting this super platform of JP Morgan, the brand, the platform, the products, and the professional expertise that one can get in India, coupled with India being such an exciting emerging market, mm -hmm. I think all was a very potent combination. Kalpana, you know, you got a great platform to grow you flowered and you managed to get uh, a bigger role for yourself uh, at 58. Can you take us through what you think the organization, first ICICI and JP Morgan, did to promote this? Because very few banks would honestly also take somebody who's been in another bank for 30 years as their India head 
and and put full faith. I mean, I think that's also commendable as far as JP Morgan is concerned. But let's step back. What do you think, if you were to identify, did ICICI and ICICI Bank later do right to encourage a lot of women like you? So ICICI, like I think all professional organization, was completely gender neutral in that sense and only merit flourished. And when I say gender neutral, I mean it in a very positive way. So you got no benefit because you were a woman, nor were you discriminated against because you were a woman. And just given the position that I talked about, I say, say women flowered very well. I realize it now, we didn't realize it when I was in ICICIS, the fact that there were so many of us there in fairly senior position, in turn act, acted as a magnet in attracting more, on, more women there. JP Morgan takes diversity very, very seriously. We have a chief diversity officer. We do diversity councils across the regions. In fact, I co-head one of our diversity councils in the region. And it's not just gender diversity, but more broad diversity in terms of local talent, Gen X, and, and the rest. So in JP Morgan, because we are 250,000 people spread across 60 countries, there is a lot of discipline and a lot of processes around ensuring that you're focused on gender diversity. There are metrics that kind of track diversity across businesses and regions and countries. And what are the interventions that you really need to make in terms of ensuring that you're encouraging gender since we are talking about gender. So I remember when I came to JP Morgan and they asked me to participate in a women's networking event. And I was skeptical to say, well, why would you do a women's only networking event? And I learned as I participated in this that women generally have a tendency, as soon as their work is over, to run home, you know, be with their families. Men will typically go out to a bar, get a drink or so, bond in those groups, will go to a sporting event together. Sure. So, unless you create a platform where women will say the organization expects you to show up on this, you will not find women going out of their work engagement in terms of bonding. Hmm. And I found it something that we should all encourage. So today I host lunches just for women. Uh, I have not done a town hall so far for women, but do a lot of engagements in under a corporate platform for women to, you know, kind of network. Two questions, you know, first is that while we talk about the discipline and processes of diversity, you know, one could also argue that if you actually look at bank to bank, Indian, Indian banks have done far better yes. in encouraging women on top. And somewhere there is a glass ceiling in, in the Western financial business. Why do you think that exists? So I think we as Indian women are somewhat privileged on two accounts. One is there is a lot of family support. So I have seen parents, in-laws uprooting themselves just to be with a daughter or daughter-in-law to help them through that childbearing and child-rearing ages. We also have a lot of domestic help. Uh, I feel my Western counterparts somewhat get challenged on both these accounts. And I actually pride myself on the fact, I think India is indeed unique to have the number of women CEOs that we have in banking. I don't think any, any country in the world would drive in there. Controlled by women. I told Arundhati that when she took over as chairperson of State Bank of India, that we now dominate 40% of Indian banking. <laughs> but, uh, but you think India, there is an advantage that we have here in India, which we should capitalize on, which is not talked about enough, and perhaps women should start looking at the advantages and not the disadvantages? Absolutely. There are great advantages, but we need to do more within the organizational construct to ensure that we handhold women when they go through these critical phases in their life. I told you I never felt, I've never felt guilty hmm. about anything. And I feel as senior women leaders, we need to focus a lot on the fact that there is no need to be guilty. We can actually have it all. Hmm. Which brings me to Indra Nui's point that, you know, women can't have it all. Do you think women are too harsh on themselves in judging themselves in saying that, hey, we, we need to do everything and we need to give our 100% to everything and hence we always feel guilty or shortchanged. Because I've never, actually you're the first woman I've met who says, you know, I'm not, I don't feel guilty about anything that I've done. No, have you, uh, have you come across any CEO 
amongst the Fortune 500 companies or whichever way you want to cut the companies. Say so he's really sorry he didn't have it all. Have you heard any male CEO tell you that? No. So I feel very strongly I think we can have it all. And I think it's important to give this message to women that you can indeed have it all. And I feel in today's day and age, my male colleagues are extremely conscious of this feeling as well. Is to say, we can have it all and the women can have it all and let's not make this discrimination. But having said that, I still believe that there are stages in a woman's life when she is, you know, pregnant. There will be that hand-holding that she will require. When she comes back from her three-month extendable to six-month maternity break, she will require hand-holding. And I think as organizations, we need to, we need to stay connected with them. Sure. They've, they've just gone for three months. That doesn't mean they need to be off the email or any other communication. You make them feel connected, required, the organization will create a pull factor for them to come back. spoke about the discipline and process that a lot of the international global companies have when it comes to diversity because it is an essential because as you said JP Morgan is in 60 countries it has different demographics and the di uh, diversity issues to tackle and gender issues to tackle what is it that we can learn in terms of processes because while in India we do have companies that have encouraged women on the whole I would say that there isn't a science to it you know it's more a loyalty it's about your connect with an individual company but there isn't really a charter what, what are the processes and, and uh, you know, disciplines that can be brought in? So some of the processes we have sought, uh, sought to put in place amongst MNCs including JP Morgan is to say let's guard against unconscious biases coming in. Mm. So when you look at a slate of candidates, ensure that there are sufficient women there or whichever diversity pool you are looking at, local talent, different academic backgrounds. Make sure that that's there in your slate of candidates. Make sure when you are interviewing these people, you know, in laterals there is no interview panel, but you will get them to meet 10 people. Make sure there is sufficient gender diversity. As I said, women do get pulled by the fact that there are other senior women who they can have a connect with. So, you know, processes like this. Just track the matrix. How many women joined? How many quit? How many quit for what reason? You know, just tracking some of this will get you focused on the action that you need to take. Creating these women networking platforms that I described to you. Staying connected with a woman when she takes her maternity break. We had an analyst who took a maternity break. Frankly, Minnie, I thought she was never away. Mm. She was so well connected. Three months after her child was born, she's enjoying, she's back in office and she's thoroughly enjoying. Not one day. Have I heard, oh, I feel guilty about this and whatnot. She continued to remain continuously engaged. One of the ways to encourage women uh, in the top rung, Kalpana, has been the fact that, you know, uh, the Companies Act and now SEBI has mandated that, you know, all companies of a certain size have a woman director. You've, you've been, you are a director in, in many boards. Uh, I'm going to talk about both the Indian boards that you are uh, a director at and international. What are the challenges women face once there? Again, I'm sorry to give you a very boring reply, but no particular challenge. It is a challenge that any male or female will face when you join a board which is in an unrelated industry from you. So understandably, financial companies don't put me on their board, right? Because I was in ICIC earlier and now in JP Morgan. So I'm on the board of a pharmaceutical company, a software company, a media company and a cigarette company. So it is what a challenge that anyone would face in trying to understand the dynamics of that industry. What are the competition? What are the business drivers? What's the strategy? Very similar, irrespective so of whichever it's gender. It's unfair to put a gender lens to it. And Absolutely. you're missing the point by putting a gender lens to exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. 
I do believe that there are different, I mean, you need a diverse slate of uh, board of directors really to bring different perspectives. Women do bring their different perspective, but no way is it a particular challenge to be as a woman on these board that you won't have if you were a male. But do you think a quota works for you? Do you think there they needs to be that hand holding to pull women up? So I am dead against quotas, uh, except when the quota is in a club that just doesn't allow you to get it. So I think you definitely need reservations in our political system because it's a club that doesn't allow enough women to come in. So I was not at all in favor of this mandatory requirement, but it is a law now. So, you know, now that it's a law, let's embrace it and do everything to truly bring in that diversity. But is it being followed to the right spirit? Because you have a lot of family members being nominated. Uh, are you kind of disappointed with that? Do you think there is enough bench of women to actually fill those posts? How do you see it panning out? So the bench issue, Mini, again, I get very impatient with that. Why doesn't anyone ask me that question about is there sufficient bench in India to have men on the board? <laughs> I like that. Right? Yeah. We have 50% representatives in, in a gender sense and it should be so. On the family thing, I have a slightly different take. If you look at the ownership structure in India, it is family dominated. So I don't think we should feel particularly critical about a family woman being represented on the board if she is indeed going to add value on that board and bring something to that board. So be it. Okay, so you think that that's okay and over a period of time you will get far more diversity within the uh, within this because you know right now also there is a pool of 20 women you know including you who are seen as, as uh, you know because a lot of companies are, are getting big names onto boards to tick off two things at one go. Do you think uh, this is a passing phase? So if you were to look at MNC boards 20 years ago, there would be a handful of Indian males who would be on those boards. None of us talked about it. Now we are talking about it because it's going to be a handful of women who are going to be on it. You will see 15, 20 years down the line, we'll look back at this and say, see how it's changed. Okay, but it's an important first step. I think it's a, as I said, I don't like mandated requirement. Now, now it is what it is. So I think we should just embrace it. Last set of questions. Uh, you know, a lot of women go through a lot of dilemmas in life. You know, I think women also have a lot of baggage, Kalpana, you know, because you're constantly having to balance things in your own head, perhaps all self-created. What would your advice be to women who are making these important decisions about whether to get married, not to get married, have children, not to have children, be at work, not to be at work, continue, push ahead, not to push ahead. What would your advice be? So my strong advice would be when you take up your job, you should be very clear that you identify with the purpose of the company. You know, different companies have different names, vision, mission, business principles, core beliefs whatever nomenclature you put to it the company exists in society for a reason do you identify with that whether it's media whether it's financial services once you identify with that and completely align everything that you do with the company's core goals i think women will do very well in the course of this journey of your professional career you have to ensure that you stay up with all your family engagements, you get married, you have children and you know, do all of that. The minute you start saying, I can do one well, but not the other, I think you're losing out. Because as I told you, I do believe it's possible for us to have it all. But just as we are all so careful in the mate that we choose to say, is there a meeting of minds? chemistry and all of that works but at the base level is there a meeting of minds you need to have a similar approach towards meeting of minds when you choose your career so you're saying it's it's more than just a job it's, it's more a than journey a job. and if you look at it as a journey then you'll have enough passion for it to continue it in it no matter what exactly and we are born with the parents that we have we are born with the siblings that we have marriage and your career is entirely in your hands and I think we should make the right choices with the right application of mind and also not ignore what your heart is saying. You know, I read the other day, I thought it was one of the best comments I've ever uh, read, which says that Indians make such great CEOs in the global arena 
because our mind is like an Anglo-Saxon, mm -hmm. but our heart is Latin, Latin American. A Latin American said this, okay. but Indians think a lot with their heart as well. So if you think with your heart and you want that place and your mind tells you that's the place you want to be, nothing can stop you. Thank you so much, Karima. Thank, Thank you. you.